Okay. Better? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, I was thinking, do I need to come up with like this opening monologue and everything? And I decided against it. Um, you're welcome. But uh, <laughs> welcome to the second version of Science Night. Before we get started, I just wanted to do some thank yous. First of all, to the town of Windsor Start for allowing to you this <laughs> Don't building. Leave. Don't leave yet. Yeah, that's, that's a, a bad omen on Windsor On Air and everything. Thank you to Windsor On Air for coming and filming this. Uh, thank you to Hanover Strings for hooking us up with the sound system. Uh, Bloods Seafood and Catering have provided us with the coffee maker and the plates. And the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium and the Echo Leahy Center for donating some great raffle items that we will be giving away later tonight. And all of you for coming. That was like, I had to put that in too, right? <laughs> so tonight we are going to have three uh, professors from Dartmouth College that are going to be talking to you kind of, sort of, about perception and, and of ways that we take in the world. And I'm super excited for the per first presenter, uh, mostly because she discovered an entire planet. Um, she is the first person I've met that's discovered a planet. And I may or may not have kind of created this entire event around getting to meet her. <laughs> um, and I definitely did do that. So. Without further stretching for time, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Newton. Okay, yeah, I'm excited uh, I, uh, to be here to talk to you today. I am a recent transplant to the Upper Valley, and I live in West Windsor, so it wasn't actually very far from me at all. Um, and I am excited to talk to you today about how we find exoplanets. These are planets outside of our solar system. Uh, so. I lived in Boston before I made it uh, up to this wonderful place, and on a lovely night in my dark street, I could see this many stars, which is 60, so you might be able to see Orion's belt and pretty much nothing else. Um, so luckily, I live here now, and uh, I get a much different view of the night sky. When we live somewhere as wonderful as this, our perception of the night sky really changes, and you can see that there's a lot more out there um, than what people in cities usually get to see. But this still isn't everything. Um, so there are about 6,000 stars that you could see from the darkest night skies on Earth. Um, but there's even more out there than that. Um, and I made this video in planetarium software. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up the color knob on, and the brightness knob on just the nearest stars to us. So you can see that there's a lot more stars starting to peek out here. So even um, many of these nearest stars to us are not objects that you can see with your eye. So going a little bit um, even farther, we, uh, this is a picture of our Milky Way galaxy. So the galaxy that we reside in is taken from inside because we cannot leave the galaxy. Um, but it's a mosaic of many different images, and you can piece together um, this view here. So that band across the middle is the Milky Way, which you can see from a um, particularly dark night. Um, and there are 200 billion stars in our entire galaxy, and so we are just one out of those 200 billion stars. Uh, and uh, we are not alone in the galaxy. We have our friends, our, our nearby planets. So our solar system, so that's us, the other planets in the solar system, their moons and asteroids, we all orbit um, our star, the sun. Um, and you know, up until a few decades ago, um, people wondered, like, are we the only planets out there? Are we the only human beings out there? Um, and what we've come to realize over the past few decades is that we are not alone. Um, and there are, in fact, um, millions, if not billions, of other planets out there. So these are other planets orbiting other stars than the sun. So, so I'm still only thinking inside of our galaxy. So, but they're outside of our solar system, but inside of our galaxy, there's these other planets orbiting these other 100 billion stars. So what I'm going to walk us through today um, is three different steps here. So first, how do we actually go about finding an exoplanet? Uh, and then I'm going to give a brief overview of the things that we know about the nearest planets. 
Uh, and then lastly, I am uh, going to touch very briefly on the planet that I found, possibly not enough, um, but you're welcome to ask me more about it. Um, okay, so let's get started. How do we find these alien planets, these exoplanets? So I'm going to talk about um, two different methods. The first is the radial velocity, um, which is also called the Doppler wobble method. And so in this method, what we're looking for, actually in both of these methods, what we're looking for is not the planet itself because these planets are very dim, they're next to these bright stars, and they're really, really far away. What we look for is the influence that the planet has on the star. So in the Doppler method, we're actually watching as the star moves in response to the planet's orbit. So usually when we think about something orbiting something else, we think about, say, the sun fixed at the center of our galaxy and a planet orbiting around it. But in fact, uh, there is an equal gravitational pull between the planet uh, and the star. And so the star is making its own little orbit also. And so our star is making its little circle around. And what we are watching for is the change in the light as it's moving towards and away from us. So this is called the Doppler shift. And it's something you're probably familiar with from the uh, sirens when they go by. So if you're familiar with when a siren is coming towards you, it's higher pitched, yeah? And when it's leaving, going away from you, it gets much lower pitched. Um, and that's the Doppler shift. So it's a change in the frequency or the wavelength of the sound wave. And we actually have the, uh, uh, almost the exact same effect with light. We have when the light uh, is traveling towards us, it gets shifted to bluer wa wavelengths, to bluer colors. And when it's moving away from us, it gets shifted to longer colors. And we can detect that motion. So what we're looking for is as the star moves, we're measuring the light from the star, and we're watching as it shifts back and forth from red to blue to red to blue. We can measure the size of that signal, and that tells us about the mass of the planet. And so this is the, one, uh, the first method um, that we can use to detect planets. So our second method is the exoplanet transit method. Um, this is the one that I, that I use. Um, and in the transit method, um, well, so this actually is a picture of an exoplanet, or of a planet transit, but not an exoplanet transit. So this is the transit of Venus um, around the sun. Um, so this, uh, that's Venus, um, and it's crossing across the disk of the star. So this um, happened in 2012, um, and I took this picture like, with my cell phone. Uh, basically. Um, it turns out the sun's really big. Uh, you don't actually need something super fancy, but you do need a filter because it's so bright. Um, so you can see also, just, it's, I think it's kind of fun, there are these um, spots on the surface of the star. So these emergences of magnetic fields that create dark spots on the surface of the sun, um, but not to be infused with Venus up there, which is quite circular and quite dark. So when I look for an exoplanet transit, I do not get to look for this. Um, the reason for that is that the stars um, are so far away that they're just point sources, these tiny point sources off in the distance. We can't actually resolve the disk of the star. We can't take a picture like this one. But what we can do is monitor the brightness of the star over time. And when the planet crosses in front of the star, it blocks out some of its light, just like we saw with Venus. And we can detect that dimming of the star's light. Um, so this here illustrates what that might look like, or what that does look like. So we're watching, and when the planet comes in front of the star, we get this kind of inverted top hat shape, and that tells us that there's a planet orbiting that star. And if we look at the depth of that dip, so how much light it blocks, <coughs> that tells us something about the radius of the planet, how big this planet is, what's, what its size is. Okay, so I wanted to walk us through the <coughs> history of exoplanet discovery. Um, so the first exoplanet that was discovered uh, is in 1995. It was discovered via the radial velocity method. Um, and this is the actual data. I pulled the data from the papers. Um, so that's what real radial velocity data looks like. You're measuring uh, as the star um, changes in its velocity due to this Doppler shift. The first planet discovered via the transit method um, was in 2003. So you can see that inverted top hat shape. The real data is a lot noisier, but there's that model there in red that's really close to that idealized picture that I showed uh, in the animation. So you can see that as time goes by, there's a few more exoplanet discoveries kind of adding in to this, our knowledge. So the, the salmon color here, that's the radial velocity discoveries. And the green, just a little blip on top, that's the transit discoveries. So something 
uh, dramatic happened in 2010, and that was the launch of NASA's Kepler mission. Uh, so Kepler uh, was a space mission, it was a telescope sitting in space, and it was staring at one patch of sky looking for transits around exoplanets. So this was a spacecraft that used the transit technique to look for exoplanets. Uh, and what it found uh, was quite a lot of planets. So Kepler really represented a revolution in our understanding of the population of exoplanets. So what are you know, the other planets that are our neighbors in the galaxy? Uh, so in 2018, uh, NASA's test mission launched. This is the successor to Kepler. Um, and uh, we're still getting data from this mission. It's up right now, it's taking data. This is the mission that, that I use in my work right now. Um, and so, so test launched 2018. Um, on, well, the launch date was April 16th. Um, so that was my husband's birthday. Um, and he consented to fly to Florida with me so that we could watch the launch, um, along with um, a lot of members of the test team in the astronomy community. Um, so this is me on April 16th. Um, you might be able to guess from my expression that the launch did not happen that day. Um, we had a great time, saw lots of cool stuff, um, but we did not see a rocket launch. Um, but we were able to change our flights, uh, and on April 18th, we watched tests go up successfully. So as of two days ago, there were 4,126 confirmed exoplanets on NASA's online catalog. Um, and I had previously shown this slide about two weeks earlier, and there were, I think, 18 more planets in that two-week period that had been discovered and added to this catalog. And most of those are coming from the test mission. Okay, and this is an overview of what all of those planets are. So these are all of the planets that have measured radii and orbital periods on that database. And so on the y-axis, I really like plots. We always have to see plots in my talks. Um, but we'll walk through it. So the y-axis is the size of the planet. So basically how big it is. So we have Jupiter, um, Neptune, and Earth for scale. So it goes from about the radius of Earth to a bit bigger than the radius of, of Jupiter. Uh, and so what we have here is a planet, many different sizes of planets. Um, we have what we call the Jupiters, very original name, are the things that are similar in size to Jupiter. Then we have the sub-Saturns, which are in between the size, you might be able to guess, of um, Really, Neptune and Jupiter, they get called some Saturns, though, for no particular reason. Um, and then lastly, we have super-Earths and mini-Neptunes. Those are bigger than Earth and smaller than Neptune. Um, so one thing that I think is really interesting about this plot is actually these super-Earths and mini-Neptunes. I think they're super cool, um, basically because we don't have one of them in our solar system. We've got uh, Earth, and then we have Neptune, and we don't have anything in between. But what we found with Kepler is that this is a really common outcome of planet formation. So we're pretty, the universe is pretty good at making planets this size, but yet we didn't get one in our own solar system. Yeah. So it looks like a bimodal distribution. You have more in this size class and a lot more in this size. Why isn't it, why isn't it normal? So there's a, a, an effect on the sizes of these planets uh, from um, mass loss. So the planets, are actually losing some of their atmosphere, some of their masses, because uh, of the irradiation from their host stars. So that tends to push things uh, mostly down. And then there's also a detection bias. It's a lot easier to find big things than it is to find small things. So uh, if we were to correct this plot for all of the different biases, there'd actually be even more super sub-Neptunes than that show up right now. Yeah? It says orbital. Uh, period than days. It, explain that. It really yeah. like 100 days to, to uh, yeah. radiate? Uh, ah, so the, so the yeah, uh, vertical axis, that's the size of the planet, and then it, what it's plotted against, which I'm, uh, it's a great question, you beat me to it, um, is the length of one year on the planet. Okay. So for us on Earth, at 365 days, uh, we would be off here, off this plot. 
um, our giant planets in the solar system are uh, even farther off the plot. And so that is actually something I wanted to draw your attention to. So, uh, yeah. so if you lived on a, another planet, you might be much younger. <laughs> because it, the planet would not go around a full... Uh, the opposite, actually. Yes, yeah, so you'd actually be a lot older. So, uh, so what we have here is that lots of these planets, one year on the planet lasts like uh, 10 days. So you wow. would have aged at least in the way that we measure time, uh, you would have aged uh, a year uh, in, you know, 10 days. 10 days. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and that is something else that I think um, is super cool about this, is that we don't have planets that are this close in our solar system. So almost all of these planets orbit their stars faster than Mercury orbits the sun. Um, and uh, so, in fact, that gives a name to actually these Jupiters. We actually call them hot Jupiters because they are hot, because they are so close to their stars. They have periods of just a few days. Oh, I just put a picture in. Uh, so this is actually the very first type of planet that was discovered, is one of these hot Jupiters. And people didn't really believe it at first because we just really didn't expect that. So we assumed Jupiter-sized planets would be where Jupiter is in our solar system, so way out, having periods of um, 5, 10 years, 20 years. Um, and so this is, again, something else. These are actually pretty rare, even though we found a lot of them. They are very easy to find, though. Um, but, but it is something that happens, and it's just we weren't expecting it until we went and kind of found it by chance. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is how do planets change with time? How do we go from um, what planets look like when they first form and to the way that they look when they are a few billion years old? So most of the planets that we know of are a billion years old, five billion years old, maybe ten billion years old. Um, and so how do we know what their history was? So we can't uh, watch planet formation in action because that process takes millions of years, tens of millions of years. And if I had to wait that long, I would not ever have gotten my PhD. Uh, so what we can do, however, is try to look at young planets. Find a planet that is only 10 million years old or that is only 100 million years old. And then we can use that snapshot in time to try to understand what the planet, uh, how the planet changed from 10 to 100 million years and from 100 million years to a giga year. So for example, that would be like looking at a baby book. These are pictures of me, obviously. <laughs> Maybe not obviously, I don't know if you can recognize me from preschool, um, and this is me in grad school. And so what we're doing is we're taking these two pictures and we're going, how do humans evolve? How do, or how do they grow up? How do they grow up from when they're born to when they're an adult? And we're doing that with these planets. So we've got a snapshot from toddlerhood, we've got a snapshot from maturity, and we're trying to understand the connection between those. Uh, so we're doing that, like I mentioned, with data from NASA's TESS mission. Uh, and what uh, makes TESS really valuable is that it's letting us look at nearby bright stars. So we've got this whole galaxy, and TESS is not actually a very big telescope, and so it can't see very far into the galaxy. But what it can do uh, is look in all directions. And so we can look at all of the nearby stars and all of the bright stars. And so with TESS, we are searching for planets around these young, nearby, bright stars. Uh, and we had our very first discovery uh, last year. The planet uh, is called DS Tuck AB. Um, so again, this is a very uh, astronomy name. So it's in the Tacana Association, so that's the Tuck. It's a variable star that gives it the DS designation. And then the capital A is because it's actually part of a binary star, and it's the brighter component, so it gets a capital A. And then the, when you find a planet, you, get, you just take the star's name and you put a B, a little B after it. So that's how you get planet names. So DS Tech AB, so this is the planet, and I led the discovery of this planet, here you go. <laughs> um, and so we found this um, in NASA's test data, um, and this is the data that we used to, to find this planet. So it shows the brightness of the star, 
as a function of time in days. So this is um, about a uh, month-long uh, time window. And when we have the brightness of the star, uh, and the most obvious thing you can see here is these big changes in the brightness. It's changing in brightness by about 4%. Uh, and so this actually has nothing to do with planets. It's actually due to the star's youth. So if we think back to the picture I showed of the sun with the transit of Venus, there are those spots on the surface of the sun. Um, and it turns out that young stars have a lot of spots. And when those spots are facing us, the star is a bit dimmer. And as they rotate out of view, the star gets brighter. And so the star gets brighter and dimmer as the spots rotate in and out of view. Um, but hidden in here are some transits. So I don't know. Maybe you can squint and see it, um, but since I think that's kind of unlikely, um, I'll point them out. So there's, uh, we missed one here, there's no data there, but we got one here, we got one there. Um, and I can zoom in on those so we can see them a little bit better. And so you can see, again, that top hat shape that we saw when we learned about how transits work. It's imposed here on that longer term variability so that the whole thing's tilted but you can see that shape um, that we've seen a few times in this talk already. Okay, so that brings me to my summary. So I talked about how the two methods we use um, primarily to find um, planets. So we have the transit method and the radial velocity method. Um, and how, especially with Kepler, we have traced out the distribution of planets uh, in our galaxy. And we found a huge range of planet sizes Mostly right now, we've only been able to find um, very, uh, pretty hot planets on short periods. Uh, and then lastly, I talked about how we can use young planets to try to trace out planet evolution um, and how we're trying to do that right now. Yes. And, ah, yes, and so bringing Bess back to our theme of perception, um, in my mind, um, as, uh, exoplanets have really changed um, how we perceive um, our neighborhood <coughs> in the galaxy, so our place in the universe. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So we will bring all of our presenters back up for Q&A at the end of it. But if anybody has any questions right now, go ahead. Um, on some of the, the graphs, what you plots. plots, yeah. Um, there were no units, so it was difficult to um, understand. For example, there. Yeah, so this um, is uh, fr a fraction. So it's just the fractional brightness. No. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, it's, uh, you know, it, uh, here on Earth we might talk about lumen. Um, and so I was look when I was looking at the uh, y-axis, and I see relative brightness and numbers, I don't know what the units are. Yeah, so we actually, in fitting these, we don't use the actual brightness of the star. We actually just... Uh, so it, 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 it's a relative. It's a relative measurement, yeah. So what we measure when we do the transit is the fractional change in brightness of the star. So we only care about fractional measurements in the star. Um, this might sound like a silly question, but um, a planet, how would you describe a planet, I mean, what, um, so uh, a layman would understand it, you know what I mean? So yeah, what defines a planet? Yes. Uh, so that's uh, not like the most straightforward question to answer. Um, so I can give you the, the first is the biggest picture um, answer to that is how we distinguish between stars and planets. Um, so a star is an object that is self-luminous. So it has hydrogen fusion, nuclear reactions going on in its core that causes our sun to shine. Um, and planets don't have that. So they basically aren't dense and hot enough for that process to occur. Um, and then we also require a planet to orbit a star, um, according to the International Astronomical Union. Um, and their definition also has a couple of other things that separate out planets and dwarf planets, which is where so things get stickier and we can talk about Pluto. So <laughs> a planet, a, a, so a, an object that doesn't orbit a the sun, what do you call that? Uh, people call them free-floating planets. Free -floating. Yeah. <laughs> if it's something that they think is not a star, um, but also doesn't orbit a star, 
then they get called free floating planets. Even though I just defined you a planet as an object that orbits a star. Did they understand? <laughs> well, of course, they probably don't understand why that thing's just sitting there. But so yeah, actually, the um, the thought is that um, planet evolution uh, is not. It's a very chaotic process. Uh, so it's not these. Um, planets calmly orbiting in circles. There actually can be a lot of dynamical interactions, and by that I mean like the gravity of Jupiter impacts um, the way that, say, Mars moves or Saturn moves. Um, and that actually can, you can kick a planet out of a planetary system. Um, and so they think that you can get free floating planets um, by basically ejecting a planet from a system. So it, it may have been a planet at one time that was. Kind of kicked out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> okay. What, what happens to that energy? Uh, uh, holding it into so, uh, the, effectively, it goes into uh, another planet or the star. So it would uh, change slightly the star's orbit, which wouldn't matter at all because the star is so massive. Or it would change um, another planet's orbit in response. So. Yeah. Uh, you, yes, you would end up with a planet that wasn't on a circular orbit, and maybe it was orbiting at an incline. Um, and so that is one of the indications that we have that planet formation might be chaotic. Um, that strikes me as such a, a specific shape. And you mentioned <laughs> that uh, the test satellite is able to uh, take in data from all points within a certain radius from where we are, is that, is that accurate? Here we take it. Yeah. So is there some, with all of that data coming in, is there some sort of like uh, automation or machine learning that goes through like the giant data? <coughs> says, hey human, you should look at this this part. Yeah, How does that work? yeah, there is. So the, there's, uh, well, there's computers both at MIT, which is um, heading the mission, and at NASA um, that are basically turning the data from um, basically CCD images like you would take on your camera um, into uh, these brightness versus time plots. Mm -hmm. And then there's a search through every one of them for things that look like transits. Mm -hmm. And then some people have used machine learning to turn that into uh, like an identification of a, hey human, you should look at this. Mm -hmm. um, at present there is a huge human uh, step mm -hmm. where there's a team of people sitting in offices at MIT and they are going planet, not planet, planet, not planet. Mm -hmm. Let, let's vote by consensus. Mm -hmm. are, uh, are there other planets in the solar system that have the exact distance from a sun, such as ours, where life, you know, as we know it, could exist? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, so are there planets that are the right temperature for life yeah. to exist? Um, the answer is yes, um, but they don't orbit stars like the sun. They actually orbit smaller, cooler stars called red dwarf stars. Okay. So uh, they're younger stars? They are, no, they're actually uh, often older, um, but they are just less massive and that makes them, uh, that makes them less bright, um, just intrinsically. It's a property of the mass of the star. Um, and so these red dwarf stars, um, the liquid water, uh, period, so how long of a year you would have to have for liquid water, is anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Um, and so your potentially habitable planet, your temperate planet, has a period of only like a few weeks to a few months. And so that's a lot easier to detect um, than it is something on a year-long orbit. Because we usually want to detect more than one transit. We pretty much always need to detect more than one transit. And if you have to wait, like, say, four years to gather four transits, then your spacecraft might break yeah. in that time. OK. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't want to cut off the Q&A, but um, there will be time to talk to them after this. So we're going to move on to our next presenter. Uh, we're going from somebody that I did not know very well to somebody who I know extremely well. Uh, Dr. Nate Dominey is the kind of person that I have a lot of weird questions and, and um, like asks, and he just kind of tends to say yes to me a lot. Um, so, 
So I guess I, 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 ought, I uh, should thank you quite a bit for, for getting me this far. So let's bring up Dr. Nate Balvany. <coughs> All right, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Can we uh, go back one slide? Okay. Uh, so I want to bring things back down to Earth, and I want to talk specifically about Earth Day in 1970. There we go. I want to talk about Earth Day, which happened 50 years ago on April 22nd, 1970. Before I talk about Earth Day, we need to talk about Richard Nixon, who on January 1st of 1970, New Year's Day, he enacted into law the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. And this was an act that really fired the environmental movement of 1970. So a few months later, in April 22nd of 1970, you had the first Earth Day, so we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary this year. And it was then the largest grassroots demonstration in human history, drawing an estimated 20 million people globally. This is the front page of the New York Times showing you the downtown of uh, New York City. So, you can imagine, if you remember, back in 1970, it was a very charged time. This is really considered the birth of the American environmental movement. <clears throat> and there was a person living in Norwich, Vermont, or a, a former resident of Norwich, Vermont, named Dr. Seuss, or Ted Geisel, oh, yeah. who was extremely motivated by this movement. And he was listening to the environmentalists, but he um, criticized the environmentalists. He said they were too preachy, full of statistics. And he felt like their message was being lost in this sort of tone of admonishment. And he felt like the proper way to communicate an environmental message would be to write a children's book. But he struggled and struggled and struggled to write this children's book. And eventually his wife, Audrey, said, right, let's get out of San Diego, let's go on a holiday, and let's go to Kenya. Now, this next, I'm going to advance the button. Do you have your sound turned up on the laptop? You may hear this, because in April 1970, a song was released, Big Yellow Taxi by Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm. It started rising through the charts. It peaked on the charts in June of 1970. And do you remember the first few lines? Shall I play it for a little bit? Mm -hmm. I hope so. Mm -hmm. you, don't have, you don't have audio? Paid Paradise. OK. All right. They paid Paradise, and they put up a parking lot. Remember the next few lines that put trees in a museum. So this was this song became the eco anthem for the environmental movement, and it was one of Ted Geisel's favorite songs. It was motivating him to write a book about trees. So he and Audrey, in August of 1970, they go to Kenya. They do not do the typical safari. They do not go driving around in game parks looking at animals. They go to this very exclusive private club called the Mount Kenya Safari Club. And this is a postcard from the same time, 1970. And there's a, a, a lake, a pond, rather, in front of this uh, club. And do you see what's swimming in that pond? A swan. A swan, right? It's an introduced animal. But he would have seen that swan. And if you know where I'm going with this, there's a particular book written by Dr. Seuss where there's a swan called the Swami Swans. And I think this swan may have inspired the Swami Swans. But let's carry on. This club is very exclusive. It was owned by William Holden, who was one of the uh, popular, he was the sort of a Jew, George Clooney of his day. Uh, this was all the A-listers and other Hollywood celebrities. Winston Churchill was a member of this club. Brooke Shields was a member of this club. That plaque in the upper left-hand corner is the plaque for Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was also a member of this private club. So this is where Dr. Seuss and Audrey go on holiday, and uh, they, they would drive around the property uh, they would see animals, but mainly Ted Geisel liked to sit by the pool. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, it's a very sort of classic safari chic kind of decor. Uh, you can imagine what it would be like to sit there and sip your gin and tonics and talk to other celebrities about the kinds of things that you've seen uh, in the day. Uh, just another shot of the, of the interior. I was there a few uh, months ago. <laughs> I could tell it's, really, it's a really lovely place. <clears throat> now that is the swimming pool. That this up in the middle of the image, this is Mount Kenya right here. And so Ted Geisel claims that he was sitting by the pool, staring at Mount Kenya, and then off in the distance he saw some elephants, and, he, and as he put it, the log jam broke, and he suddenly was inspired. He grabbed a laundry sheet, shown there on the right, he flipped it over, 
and he wrote 90% of the Lorax in a single afternoon. And that is the way Dr. Seuss always worked. He always wrote the text first, and then he would paint the, uh, the paintings later, and then associate them later in the process. So there's the pool of the Mount King Safari Club, and there's the laundry sheet where he wrote 90% of the Lorax for us. Simulated laundry sheet. Uh, he returned to San Diego, he started doing the artwork, and um, a few months later in May, he gets a call from Lyndon Baines Johnson. Hmm. Lyndon Baines Johnson says, I hear you're writing a book about the environmental movement. Lady Bird Johnson's a big fan of the environmental movement. I really like your initial sketches to go into my presidential library, which was then being built in Austin, Texas. And so Dartmouth has, uh, I should have mentioned, Ted Geisel was a, a graduate of Dartmouth, class of 1925. He lived in Norwich, Vermont for a while before he moved on and started doing uh, 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 work in the advertising industry in New York City. Uh, but at this point in his life, he's living in San Diego. So we at Dartmouth have archives for much of his work between, from the Second World War, so 1940 to 1950. Uh, UC San Diego has his archives of everything afterwards, from 1955 to roughly 1995. He died in 1991. Um, so <coughs> those two archives have everything except the Lorax materials, which are in the uh, Lyndon Brain's um, uh, presidential library in Austin, Texas. Okay, so the Lorax was eventually published in August of 1971. It was the only one of his books to not become a bestseller. It was extremely controversial at the time. It's the only one of his books to have been banned by a public library in California. It, this, this banning of a book, I mean, I think it's inappropriate to ban any book, but to ban a children's book, come on. So this was the subject of, uh, of the national news. So Tom Brokaw did a whole segment on the banning of a Dr. Seuss book. Yet at the end of his life, when Dr. Seuss was asked which of his works was his favorite, he said it was The Lorax. The Lorax is a challenging book to read. As a parent, you try to read this book, and it's got his most inventive language, his most unusual words. This, the cadence is really quite um, uh, awkward sometimes. And it's also um, confusing for kids, at least my kids. If you remember the story, there is a, a creature called the Onceler. And the Onceler discovers that if he cuts down these trees, uh, these trupola trees, and he can produce something called need, and need is something everybody needs. And so my kids see that, and they say, that's a pretty good thing. It's very entrepreneurial. This, this person saw that somebody needed things, people needed things, and he produced these things that people needed. So why is that a problem? So I just overdid it, right? It's not sustainable. And at the very end of the book, if you remember, the Wunzler regrets how uh, unsustainably he harvested all the triple trees. But there's one last remaining seed, and so the Wunzler leans out, and he drops the last remaining seed in the hand of a child, and says, the responsibility is yours. The world's going to be ruined unless you do something about it. And so my kids sort of say, that's a lot of responsibility for a child. So there's no parent in the Lorax. In fact, there's no parent in any Dr. Seuss book, with one exception, in The Cat in the Hat. Do you remember the very last page in The Cat in the Hat? You see the mother's legs. She's entering the scene, and the child is asked, would you tell your mother what would happen? That's another morally ambiguous thing. Should the child lie? Should the child tell the truth? And I think that's part of the genius of Dr. Seuss, is that it's not an easy story. It's a more, it can be morally confusing sometimes for kids. In any case, here is how we think of the Lorax. There's the orange, mustached creature standing there with a trupola tree. So this is one of his initial sketches. This is a sketch that's in the Lyndon Baines, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, Presidential Library. This is the uh, initial appearance of the Lorax into the book. The Wunzler is there on the left uh, with knitting needles. He's producing a need something, a sweater perhaps. And uh, I'll just read the text to you. Um, the instant I'd finished, I heard a gazup. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I'd chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him? That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and greenish and mossy. And he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. <laughs> Environmentalists don't particularly like the Lorax, even though it has an environmental message, because the Lorax is sharpish and bossy. The Lorax is 
speaks with a tone of admonishment. The Lorax reprimands the Wunzler for his behavior. The Lorax is typically viewed as an eco-policeman. Environmentalists believe that's not the best way to communicate an environmental message. You can't be criticizing and admonishing and reprimanding if you want the person you're dealing with to um, uh, understand where you're coming from, to understand your particular message. So many people view the Lorax as an inappropriate symbol or model for communicating environmental messages. Yes? Isn't he really just describing what's occurring rather than making a judgment about it? That, I, I like that interpretation. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will return to that interpretation. If, if you view him as a, do you view the Lorax as an eco-policeman, some kind of steward of the environment, or is the Lorax a member of the environment? Is the Lorax a victim? And I want to return to that point in a moment. So what did Dr. Seuss see in Kenya that may have inspired this kind of interaction between the Lorax emerging from the stump of a tree, interacting with the stump of a tree? Um, well, this is a very particular monkey. It's called a patis monkey. It is one of the most unusual monkeys. It has the longest legs for its body size of any monkey. It's the greyhound of the monkeys. They live in savanna-like habitats, and they are extremely fast. They're the fastest of all monkeys. They are also the sweatiest of all monkeys. We put them on treadmills, and we've measured their sweat production. And they are second only to humans among all primates in their ability to produce sweat. So they have long hind limbs. They're very sweaty. So for many anthropologists, this is your model for what it would be like if you were evolving on a savanna-like uh, habitat. You would evolve long limbs. You would want to dissipate heat. You'd evolve a lot of sweat glands to be able to um, uh, uh, benefit from evaporative cooling. So we tend to think of this money, monkey as a very specialized animal for family conditions. Uh, wh uh, when my friends or family come out to visit me in East Africa, I used to say, if Dr. Seuss were to invent a monkey, it would be this one. And now I think that, uh, in fact, this monkey inspired him. This is what it looks like in their habitat. So they live in a very particular type of habitat with, uh, that's dominated by these trees. These are called whistling thorn acacias, or acacia drapanolobium. And these monkeys are specialists on these trees. They consume 90% of their diet comes from this tree. They eat the flowers, they eat the fruits, they eat the ants that live inside these, these galls, which we call a domatia. There's little ants that live inside them. and they, 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 The plants are accommodating those ants. The ants will attack potential predators, and the plants actually feed the ants with little nectaries. Uh, so the monkeys will come and eat the ants. They'll eat the nectaries. They, they eat the gum that exudes from the tree when beetles bore into the tree. They consume a lot of the gum. So they are utterly dependent on this tree. And so what I think happened is I think Dr. Seuss was in this habitat. He saw these weird, spindly-looking trees. Uh, he saw this monkey that sort of tall, sort of vanish, right? They uh, produce a call. They have a, it's called, it's, uh, it sort of sounds like, poppies, poppies. It's a weird call. And then they do it when they're alarmed. And uh, when in the Lorax, if you read it, go home and read it tonight, um, the Lorax speaks with a sawdusty sneeze. So I think even the vocalizations of the Pattus monkey are being represented in the Lorax. All right, we say, okay, they, I get it. He's, it's, it's orange. Uh, yeah, he's got a mustache. I, you know, he stands on two feet. Maybe the vocalization, I, you know, a lot of that's similar, but maybe that's just my human subjective bias coming into play here. Um, and, and then in the Lorax, you have actually in the back cover, you have this spindly looking tree, which I think is an untufted triplet tree uh, that looks a lot like the acacias in this image here. So I think there's so much in common, given the timing, the, uh, the presence of these species in that habitat, I think there's a lot to say that maybe uh, Dr. Seuss was inspired by these interactions, these ecological interactions. Now, the, the patus monkey does not, um, it depends on the tree, but I don't think the tree really benefits from the monkey. So this is a type of interaction that we in ecology would call a commensalism. One party benefits and the other sort of doesn't, doesn't benefit, but it's not hurt either, it's sort of neutral. So, how do we test this? As a scientist, I want to say, right, I want to move away from my own bias opinion, and I want to see if I can really test this idea that the, that the Pattus monkey was the inspiration for the Lorax. So here we are photographing every image of the Lorax in the book. There are 14 representations of the Lorax. And we use a standardized camera with standardized color, and those are every, this is the face of every Lorax in the book. I believe there's 14, I remember correctly. Uh, 13, sorry. So, 
When we ask a computer then to make a composite of all 13 of those faces, this is what we get. The computer recognizes the eyes, the nose, and the mustache. Those are really consistent. But the, the perimeter of the face gets a little bit blurry, and so the computer interpolates that as more, a little bit more error. And we want to be able to compare that face of the Lorax with all the monkeys in Africa and all the monkeys in Kenya, all the potential monkeys that uh, Dr. Seuss could have seen. Now, in 1968, however, Dr. Seuss published a book before he went to Kenya. Does anyone remember this creature? What, is, what book does this come from? Do you remember the Foot Book? Published in 1968. So that book also has an orange creature that's standing on two feet, walks around with his big feet. And so we thought, oh dear, what if Dr. Seuss just really likes orange creatures that stand on two feet and it's just sort of an archetype and the Lorax just um, by sheer coincidence looks a little bit like a paddis monkey. So we can do the same procedure with all the images of this creature from the foot book. Now, this is my only bivariate plot, and this is um, asking a computer algorithm to take every face that we fed it and do a machine learning approach and ask the computer to orient these faces in a bivariate face space. So it's a little bit like facial recognition. And these are the different monkeys, and you can see that there's error around the edges. That's why they look a little bit blurry. These are all the monkeys that live in Kenya. These are all the monkeys that Dr. Seuss could have seen on this trip. And what you'll notice is that the Lorax is much closer to the Pattis monkey here in the space space than the bipedal creature from the foot foot is. So I think that's non-random. And of all of these monkeys, the Lorax sort of <coughs> comes close to something called a blue monkey, but Dr. Seuss probably didn't see the blue monkey. It lives in forests, and Dr. Seuss never went to a forest. So of all the potential monkeys, I think the Lorax really comes close to the Pattis monkey. So I think even an unbiased computer <coughs> say there's something non-random about it, that the, the Lorax and the Pattis monkey look, really look quite similar to each other. So I just want to review a little bit. Uh, here's a map of Kenya. And the Mount Kenya Safari Club is right here. The town of Nanyuki is there. The capital city of Nairobi is there. And what this map of Kenya is showing is showing the distribution of Pattis monkeys historically in gray. Uh, when researchers from the 50s on would notice their distributions. And then recently, we had the distribution of Pattis monkeys between 1996 and 2004 in purple. And what you'll notice is there's a big difference between the distribution historically and the distribution now. In fact, it's a reduction of about 50% in terms of their overall population in Kenya. And so what I think we have in the Lorax is a sad case, maybe, of, uh, or what we have here is rather a case of of um, life imitating art, which was inspired by life. And, um, and uh, I think uh, in many ways, on this 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we have a lot to learn from rereading the works. So I just want to talk a little bit, uh, or maybe I should just end a little bit about the influence of the Lorax. Because in biology, we talk about, we, we, you know, you've seen the polar bear as being this iconic representation of climate change in the Arctic. We talk about uh, animals that have charisma that can be used to um, inspire people to donate money. And so we talk about flagship species, a, a species that is elevated above others to help raise money and awareness for conservation. And one of the best examples of a flagship species is this one. This is called the golden lion tamarind. And in the early 1990s, the Brazilian government decided to put that primate on its currency to communicate to people the importance of this particular species. It's a primate, it's got charisma, it meets all the definitions of charisma. And I think it's no accident that the first flagship species to be used as an icon for conservation happened to be orange and look a little bit like the Lorax. The Lorax really set the template for how we think about conservation today. All right, um, and I think I'll just end there and take questions or turn it over to Ryan. So, we can take a few questions, one or two questions. Right, maybe two questions. Yes. So when you showed the uh, um, the map of the distribution of the monkeys, um, would the acacia distribution be similar? Did that change as well? Good question. So we think the main cause of this reduction in habitat, uh, reduction in population sizes, has nothing to do with poaching or anything like that. It's the loss of their trees. 
and the trees turn out to be very, very good for firewood. Um, the trees, um, um, uh, drought, the, level, the number of droughts is increasing in Kenya, and when big animals like giraffes or rhinoceros or elephant, when they can't eat their normal things, they'll turn to these acacia trees. So I think they're getting hammered through successive droughts, and then people are cutting down the trees for charcoal mainly, and so it's the loss of the trees that's driving the loss of the monkeys. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a lot of uh, concern of, uh, that uh, the animal, uh, we talk animals, that you know they come to, uh, they are coming closer to human um, population mm -hmm. and their danger to them. My question is, don't you think that's a problem of the of the our species that it's expanding and taking away the yes. very habitat. habitat loss is, yeah. is a big factor, and um, uh, those trees might well get cut down for um, for grazing for cattle uh, or for, for putting planting gardens that sort of thing. So yeah, you know, habitat loss is a big big problem. Yeah, so, but it does come back to perception. I was, I was trying to, I forgot to make the, the computer has perception too. <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, Ryan, is that your next? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so our last presenter is Ryan Calsby. He is a professor of biology at Dartmouth College. And he had the rare joy of attempting attempting to teach me biology last term. So let's bring up Ryan. What James doesn't tell you is that he uh, knows more vertebrate zoology, vertebrate biology than I do. So I actually would come to class every day sweating, thinking, please don't let James call BS on me. So we talked about the discovery of planets and uh, the discovery of childhood um, story heroes. Today I'm going to talk, I'm going to switch gears, it's going to be a little bit like pulling the needle off a record, because now I'm going to talk about the discovery of love. And I see what our, I don't want to make any judgments, but I see potentially a lot of couples in the room, maybe some married couples. Are there married couples in the room? Anybody willing to admit it? <laughs> some of you might be young enough to still be dating, I won't call you out on that. If you are, uh, the married couples might be more shocked by this than the dating couples, but it's certainly going to give you both pause. Because what I want to talk about now, in the, and I'm going to, we're a little bit pressed for time, so I'm going to skip some of this, but I want to talk a little bit about how you all think you found each other, and how you may actually have found each other, and what that difference might mean for you. And it's, I'm sorry to say it's going to keep you up at night. So, <laughs> what you're looking at here are, of course, a bunch of pictures of beautiful animals, right? From Some from our own environment, some from other places. Here's a, a widow bird from the continent Nate was just talking about in Africa. Here are some salmon, some fish that my graduate student studies. Uh, chameleons from Madagascar. We have turtles from the tropics. One thing you'll notice about many of these animals here are elephant seals from uh, Santa Cruz, California, which is where I did my PhD is that in all of these cases, one of the two sexes is significantly larger than the other. We call this sexual dimorphism. The fact that in most of these cases, males tend to be the larger sex. It's not the case in salmonids where females tend to be bigger. There are different reasons why one sex might be larger than the other, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But you're probably all familiar with this general idea that in many cases, males tend to be big and showy, and females tend to look at those males and decide who they want as a mate. Now this is a grand oversimplification, okay? And I'm not gonna talk too much about the exceptions today, but as a general rule, this is sort of what we often think of as driving the evolution of mating systems. That is to say why some individuals get to mate and others do not. As it turns out, for females, almost all females always get to mate. Lucky you. But for males, we either have males that are the sort of superstars of the population or a whole slew of other males that end up being losers. And so it's actually a very hard thing to go through the world studying this professionally when you are, as I am, I hope you all recognize, male. Now, faced with the possibility that one could end up a terrible loser in this mating game, you can imagine it's sort of interesting to figure out what drives the difference in the winners and the losers. 
Traditionally, we think of these guys, a, a big showy male with a big peacock feather fan, as saying something very particular to, to females. Does anybody know what this says in peacock speak? Ah, good provider. It's, that's a great guess. It's actually the opposite. He is l almost literally saying, hubba hubba. <laughs> Check me out. He's literally just saying, I'm good for nothing except these jeans. It takes amazing jeans to make this bright, colorful plumage display. And if you want access to those jeans, this is, what has two thumbs and great jeans? This peacock, right? Now, other males... None in particular is shown here, but other males that are less showy or less fanciful might be saying something other than I have great genes. They might say things like, I'd be a great provider. I have a great territory. I have retreat sites from predators that you can use. I have great foraging opportunities. All these things that you can give to your offspring. Now, since Darwin, okay, for over 150 years, since the time of Darwin, these two sort of distinct drivers of mate choice have largely structured the way we think about how females choose mates. More recently, we've realized that there's a lot more complexity to this. And what I want to tell you today is not that Darwin was wrong and not that these fundamental um, sort of good genes versus what we call direct benefits of mate choice, the sort of what I can get from choosing this particular male, what I can get either for myself or for my, for my offspring. I'm not going to tell you that any of that is wrong. But I'm going to add a piece to the puzzle. And that piece that I want to add is called uh, sexual conflict. Now, you all intrinsically know what sexual conflict is, right? And I'm not talking about fighting over who didn't replace the toilet paper roll or who didn't empty the dishwasher. That's another kind of sexual conflict. I'm going to talk about the kind of conflict that arises because despite the fact that males and females of almost every sexually reproducing species share all the same genes, and all, by all I mean 99.97% of the same genes. The Y chromosome carries about 0.03% of the human genome. It's functionally very, almost next to nothing on the Y chromosome. But what makes a good male and a good female are very, very different. And I'll just go back here to underscore that point, right? This male elephant seal, or these two male elephant seals, are very, very different creatures than the females with which they're trying to mate. This male hook-nose salmon is dramatically different in the way he looks, what we call his phenotype, from the female. These two different beetles look dramatically different, but they have all the same genes in common. So how does natural selection do this? Here's a simple scenario for what we call a sexually monomorphic species. That is a species where males and females don't really look that different from one another. They don't do very different things. And so what you see here is the, the distribution of the phenotype in the population. This could be any phenotype you like. We call it a quantitative trait, something you can measure. It could be body size, it could be plumage coloration, whatever. Pick your favorite trait. The distribution looks like this. There's some mean value to the trait. Some individuals have larger values. Some individuals have smaller values of the trait. But on average, most, most of those individuals are right in the middle. And it's true for males and for females. So they both look alike. And the trait has a genetic basis, which I have cleverly denoted with <laughs> DNA up above there. Okay. In the world that is conjured up by this image, there's no conflict. Males and females can both sort of create the phenotype that best fits the way natural selection will operate on them. There's no difference between them, and so everybody can be happy. So we represent that here with a fitness surface that shows the probability of survival or the probability that they get to mate as a function of this phenotype, their body size, let's say. Okay? Everybody's great. Males and females both have the same phenotype. It's optimized in terms of what works really well in the world, who gets to mate, okay? So there's no conflict. But as soon as what makes a good male differs from what makes a good female, now imagine you're an elephant seal, and man, oh man, you've got to be a big elephant seal on the beach or you're just going to get creamed. All those little elephant seal males, they either are killed or pushed to the outer periphery of the harems of these, of these female elephant seals, they don't get anything. They're the losers in the seal realm, okay? If selection favors a really big male, 
and a really small female, but you have to create these optima, that is to say you have to achieve these, these sort of selective advantages from the same distribution of phenotypes. Boy, now you're in trouble, right? Because only these males are going to get to mate, and only these females are going to survive the whole mating enterprise. Now we've got severe conflict in the system. And what can happen as a result of that is that we get tension on the genome. And what I mean by that is, this is sort of a nondescript term, it's not really a technical term to say that there's tension on the genome, but genes are being pulled in one direction in males, make me bigger, make me bigger, I, I, I have to be big, the king of the beach, or I'm just not going to get any access to females. But genes are getting pulled the other direction in females, make me smaller. Keep me smaller, I don't want to be confused for a male and they might try to fight with me, or whatever the outcome might be. Okay? That tension on the genome will ultimately result in this sexual dimorphism that I started talking about. Now we suddenly get the evolution of genes that are expressed more, uh, let's say more completely to a greater degree, or perhaps even only in males. Think of your traits like male pattern baldness, my receding hairline, uh, body hair, things like this. These are sex-limited traits. They tend to be traits that are turned on by things like testosterone or turned on in females by, by um, things like estrogen or progesterone. Okay? So the evolution of sexual dimorphism allows males to move out towards their fitness peak and at the same time allows females to get closer to their fitness peak. So sexual conflict starts to resolve a little bit in this mating system. The conflict is completely resolved when we get the total sex-limited expression of those genes. So genes that are only expressed when they're, when they're found in males, and other genes that are only expressed when they're found in females. But remember, the same genes are being passed between males and females all the time. So this male will pass these genes on to his daughters as well as his sons. Okay? So there's still a potential for conflict here. So for those of you with male and female offspring, this is where I don't want you to think too hard about this, okay? Because you know, <coughs> the outcomes could be disastrous for you psychologically. You'll, you'll understand this in just a minute. What are the consequences of this conflict? Well, theoretically, as I said, we should get a set of genes that make great males. And we should get a set of genes that make great females. But neither will necessarily make good progeny of the opposite sex. So in other words, we'll get daughters that have very high potential fitness, shown here. That is to say, those daughters will grow up to be great females. They'll produce lots of great, imagine it's a bird. She'll lay wonderful eggs with beautiful nests, and she'll be a wonderful provider and all of these things. But if those genes get canned into sons, hmm. And vice versa, right? These male benefit alleles can produce great sons. Man, is he sexy. Look at that plumage. He's huge. He's got a beautiful song. He's an artist. He's an engineer. He's whatever, right? You're so proud of your son. He's got great genes, but you kind of got to hope he doesn't produce daughters or that those genes don't end up in your daughters because the risk is that you'll make a low quality progeny of the opposite sex. This seems a little esoteric, right? It's what we call the negative intersexual heritability for fitness. And so the way we test for this, the only way I can really illustrate this, is using the classic example of a low quality male who somehow, against all odds, paired with a high quality female. We can all agree. Does everybody recognize these two characters? You've got the beer swigging, donut chomping, knucklehead, Homer, duh, married, to what can only be described as, I mean, geez, what a babe. The hair, <laughs> the bod, right? Marge Simpson. Now, Homer goes on to produce this little scofflaw of a son, a skate punk, a ne'er-do-well, drop out of school, right? Graffiti everywhere. Marge produces Lisa, a musician, a poet, a philosopher. Within the sexes, quality is heritable. We say it can be passed from one generation to the next. And the relationship is positive. Bad male, bad son. Great female, great daughter. 
But between the two sexes, we get this negative relationship. It's not a bivariate plot, but you could imagine it as one if you'd like. A low quality male might not really be that low quality. He's just got the genes for making great daughters. So the question we started to ask in my lab, and to be fair, I don't work on cartoon characters. Uh, I work on primarily lizards and frogs and to a lesser extent turtles and fish. But what we wanted to ask was, when a female assesses Homer and all of the other guys at Lucky's Bar who are swilling beer at the bar, are they looking at those males and actually going in their head, is that a way for me to make great daughters? In other words, when a female chooses a male, is she perhaps making a choice based on his capacity to produce high quality offspring of one sex or the other? And if so, then are females constrained to only make high quality progeny of one sex? So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a little bit of this. I'm just going to show you that there are some examples that this is actually a real phenomenon. I'll, I'll just show you one of these. and I'm going to show you the next one because it's a little bit clearer. When we look at, these are data from crickets, of all things. Who would think that crickets are making these complicated decisions? But if you look at a male that we have scored in the field as being a successful male, we know males are successful because females chew on their bodies while they're mating. It's kind of sexy, right? <laughs> you can score a male as having mated or not. So we would call a mated male a high quality male and a male without chewing marks, sorry, and an unsuccessful male, we can then ask what, what are the quality of their male and female progeny. And lo and behold, a successful male, shown here, successful males make very successful sons, but poor quality or unsuccessful daughters. And vice versa, unsuccessful males make crappy sons, but man, they make great daughters. So there's this Homer and Marge effect. There's this negative intersexual heritability of fitness that seems to reflect the fact that um, the pattern is real. Now, this is just gnarly stuff, so I'm going to skip this because we're running a little bit late. But I do want to point out I have lots of bivariate plots here. Okay? So we come back here and we ask the question, are they just looking at this pool of males going, maybe this is a way for me to make great daughters? And I'm going to end with the work that we've done to test this hypothesis using anolis lizards which is the, like the super common pet traded an old little brown lizard. You've probably all seen it in the West Lab pet store or if you've ever been to Florida, they're everywhere. Anoles are hugely dimorphic in body size. Males can be up to three times larger than females, making them even more dimorphic than elephant seals. But Attenborough is not going to be making a special on these lizards anytime soon because they're only this big. It's, I think they're lovely, but they're not that charismatic when it comes to the BBC. <coughs> Females tend to mate with both large and small males. Again, I'm going to skip this in the interest. Oops, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time, and then realize I don't have the slide in there that I want to show. You. <coughs> but females tend to mate with large males and small males. They're highly promiscuous, and then they store the sperm from these multiple males in their body cavity, and they slowly dole it out over several months as they lay egg after egg after egg. The sperm live in their body. They're highly buffered inside the female body cavity, and they can stay alive. And what we found is that rather than being constrained by this sort of Marge versus Homer mate choice dilemma, the females sort out the sperm from these two different types <coughs> of males. And they keep the Y-bearing sperm, the Y-chromosome sperm, from the big males to make their sons, and they dump their X sperm, and they use the X chromosome bearing sperm from small males to make their daughters, and they dump the Ys. So at least in the lizard realm, this story about sexual conflict is actually a story about sort of the women's lib, if you will, of the <laughs> lizard realm, because females have their cake and eat it too. Now, how does this all relate to perception? Well. I'll end with this. From a behavioral standpoint, you would watch these lizards mate and think these big males have all the control in the world. They determine whether the female mates with them or not. Behaviorally, they're dominant and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, our perceptions are often wrong. And when we look deeper using techniques like um, molecular biology and mate choice studies in the laboratory, we find that females have an unbelievable degree of control over the decisions that they make around these mating outcomes. And so 
Females get the best of both worlds. And with that, um, I will cut the rest of this short. And I think you want to turn it over to like a group kind of question answer thing. Maybe I can take a couple of questions before we do that. Is that all right? Yeah, you can take some questions. I just want to go get By all means. Yes. OK, well, kind of just blew my mind. But um, so are you finding that the choices of choosing the, um, the male or female, the, the female choosing an offspring of um, a male or female correlate to the the diversity within the population. I mean, what's driving the choice? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's it, it appears to be somewhat dependent on the on the actual environment, but all we really know about that is that the effect still happens when we do this in the laboratory outside of the natural environment. But it but it they get less accurate. And so we think the females need to assess a group of males to kind of really know what big is, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if you give a female two males of very close body size, she doesn't do it. If you give a female a really big male and a really small male, she's really good at sorting the sperm out. And the smaller the difference, the less able she is to do it. So it has something to do with the relative size of the males around. You've all heard about the smelly t-shirt experiments yes. done with humans. So this is another sort of case where we, we'd all love to believe that we're with the person we're with. I'm, I'm just going to not look at any of you. We'd all love to believe <laughs> for the right reasons, right? But in so many cases, the underlying biology tells us a different story, that our perceptions are only part of the picture, that we see a very small sliver of what's actually going on. So this is... Uh kind of uh, a way of uh, evolution to survive. It, in other words, this thought process is not really, uh, the female is not really thinking this in her head. It's just a way for the human species to continue surviving. Yeah, both in the case of the t-shirt example, the smelly t-shirt example, and in the case of the lizard choice, the choice is not conscious. This is something that natural selection has favored because it's to the adaptive benefit of the offspring of the lizard, right? Those progenies survive better when the females do the sperm sorting thing. So it has evolved. There are cases where um, the, the effect of sexual selection is actually to drive the population level fitness down. The populations do worse because of this. So, all of these males that are so showy that get so much access to females, they end up making really crappy daughters. And so the population does worse. So the long-term evolutionary outcome of this could actually be very bad for the species, but that's not how evolution works. Evolution only cares about the individual. At, taken to the extreme, evolution only cares about the genes of the individual getting into the next generation. So if you want to think of yourself as a mere vehicle for your genes to get passed on, it's another thing you can keep you up at night. But. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, how did the existence of harem behavior uh, influence it? Because it, in the seals I worked on, the females don't have a choice. Yeah, that's a great question. And so in the case of elephant seals, those females probably don't have much choice either. What they can do is choose where they aggregate on the beach, and they will often, uh, a big alpha elephant seal male, as you probably know, can have a harem of hundreds of females. I was with the, with the northern first. Okay. Um, but harem behavior is sort of harem behavior, and so these females can choose where to aggregate spatially on the beach. And so um, there might be a component of female choice there for the male, and might be what we call mate choice copying. Females assume, oh, there are a lot of females over there. They must know something, so I'll go hang out there. And then the selection is largely at the level of male-male competition. Those males fight vigorously. They'll, they'll wound each other, that sort of thing, so that the biggest males, the males that are most capable in the, in the arena of fighting, end up having access to all of those females. So selection, sorry, just to finish this thought, selection favors those really, really big males to be good fighters. And the idea is that f selection probably fam favors females to remain small so that they don't get caught up in the fray of males. They're easily recognizable as not male. So from a female's perspective, they just want to stay out of the fray. Go ahead, you had a follow-up. In, in the circumstance I saw, then all the bachelor bulls were uh, uh, segregated Beach, but then humans 
intervened and those actual bulls became the fur coats. Ah. So they were, they were then artificially removed from the pond. Yeah, so this is, we have natural selection, we have sexual selection, and then of course artificial selection, which we probably have the longest history of studying. It's what we, what, the way we've created large milk volume producing cows, excellent egg laying chickens, right? You've seen the beakless chickens that can't peck their own, this is all artificial selection. Uh, antler size in deer by hunting, right? We're decreasing rack sizes in deer. These are all examples of artificial selection. The fur seal um, taking out the small males is another example of that. These are all dynamics that come into play ultimately, yeah, though, though these are much more recent phenomena than the millions of years of evolution that's driven the differences in body size. Yeah, great questions. All right, thank you to all the presenters. Um, we went a little bit longer than I was expecting, so instead of having like a formal q and A, I I think we'll just break off and have some refreshments and the presenters will be here. You can talk to them at your leisure and I, I, I hope that you all do. Um, before we go, I do have the winners of our raffle. Uh, Dr. Newton discovered the two winters, uh, winners, just as she did a planet, which I will never stop talking about. And if I discovered a planet, I would rarely shut up about it, <laughs> just so that's on the record. So the winner of the um, Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium membership is Dan Waite. And the winner of the Echo Leahy Center is Derek Young. So I have your stuff. You can pick it up. Thank you all for coming. We have refreshments over here. Good night. Be good, Derek. Thank you.